Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Belinsky. Thank you for having me. Perhaps we could start with a brief sketch of your own background, and then from that, uh, what led, led you to orthography, and then from there, into request. There, there is a marvelous line from one of Ionesco's plays about mathematics leads to philology, and philology leads to crime. And I feel like I've been a little bit of, of that route. I, I went into college uh, to be an electrical engineer and spent five years in a five-year program, then switched to linguistics and psychology, worked in that for a PhD, linguistics mainly. Then I went into an English department and uh, taught linguistics, structure of English courses, uh, discovered that computer sciences paid more and it promoted faster. So then I switched to computer sciences, and that was at the University of Wisconsin. When I left there, I was chairman of the department, and I left to go into an education department. Now, that's, that's the underlying story. The story that brings me to uh, orthography, to reading, is that during the time I was switching from engineering to linguistics, I was hired to um, work on an artificial intelligence project. We were going to build a machine that we could train to recognize speech. Now, please don't ask me, did it ever work, because it has an obvious answer. Um, they am more interested in the psychological and linguistic questions than I did with the switching circuits that I was hired to uh, develop, and which I wasn't doing very well with anyway. So that's what actually led me to, to solidify a presence in linguistics. But that then led to being hired to write a computer program to relate spelling to sound in 20,000 dictionary words for a, a reading project at Cornell at that time. Now, the truth of the matter was, I couldn't write a program for any computer. I mean, I was trained to develop circuits and, you know, what happens to electrons when they roll off the end of a round steel ball on a dry day on a, on a flat rug. Was, was most of my training, but what happened was I went to the sales office that was supplying the new computer, a control data machine, for uh, Cornell's computing center and got a manual. And as any overly snide graduate student at the time, I of course marked up all of the inconsistencies in the writing and all the non-verb noun agreements and took it back to the person uh, uh, in the sales office. Well, oddly, that led to being hired to teach technical writing at Control Data's programming office, where I actually learned to program and wrote the program, finally, to relate spelling to sound. And I went on to do my dissertation on the topic, both the history and a sort of structural transformational <laughs> analysis of, of English. So <clears throat> that's what got me into orthography. Because I was in orthography, not because I knew anything about reading, the reading people came to me soon after I finished and started teaching, saying, well, gee, you must know all about spelling, and we put money into a spelling program, and we're not going anywhere. Would you be willing to consult on this? So pretty soon I found that I was becoming the, I wouldn't say the leading expert, but a so-called expert on English spelling, English reading. Epitomized by that picture on the top of the mountain, I think. I mean, I think a lot of people do respect you in just that way. So you went to the website. Of course, yes. Well, the other accident uh, that I should mention is that while I was at Stanford doing my PhD in linguistics, a postgrad in psychology was sent to me to get some of the data that I had generated on letter sound correspondences because he was working with Pat Supis on one of his computerized reading programs. And we had a very pleasant 10 minute conversation, and he went off with reams of printouts as we produced in those days. <clears throat> 
And I, I didn't see him again, uh, ever at Stanford. But uh, when I finished and took a position at Wisconsin and arrived on campus, for one reason or another, I was in the psychology building and I walked by a door and there's this fellow's name on the door. It was a very distinctive name, Calfee, so it's not one you forget very easily. So I knocked on the door and by God, he was there. So we had this marvelous reunion of our 10 minute conversation at Stanford the year before. And he mentioned to me that there was a new research and development center at Wisconsin with lots of money and not much to do with the money. And maybe he and I ought to talk about some kind of research project, maybe studying how children learn letter sound correspondences. Well, that's what got me into reading in a real sense. And from that, we worked, oh, about eight years together on how children learn to read, pre-reading skills, letter sound correspondences. He then went on to Stanford to, to teach, and I continued working at Wisconsin for a number of years with Don Lucero and others. And then I decided to be honest and really live within an education department. And that's what brought me out to Delaware. So there's a long and perhaps overdone answer to what you that's probably a, thought was a very simple question. No, I never expected it to be simple. I appreciate the background. And uh, have you ever done an interview like this before? No. Good. Well, I wanted to let you know that, that uh, we'll get you a copy of all of this. Because I think the story that you just told has got to be interesting to some of your family and friends. It's a beautiful Good. story. And I myself can also say that I relate to this, <clears throat> uh, this synchronous, serendipitous um, path that we get on that seems to be wiser than we are somehow and getting us to where it is we need to be focused that we can't claim credit for. Yeah, I mean, it's like <laughs> saying that we don't really grow up, we just follow the string that somebody draws across the floor. Yeah. And if it leads here or there, well, that's where we go. Yeah. Well, thank you. So, um, I think that's a fascinating and interesting and uh, alternative, I mean, rather than growing up in the field of orthography, or growing up in the field of reading science, that you've taken this path that would allow you to look at these things with entirely different lenses than people that grew inside of these uh, tracks um, uh, more, in a more traditional way. I never, I never felt that it was a huge advantage, but I always felt it was an advantage to, to come at the orthography from a more um, physics, math, engineering standpoint. So, so the, your kind of uh, takeoff ground in this was to, to actually try to, um, to take on the challenge of how could a machine reconcile the spelling sound took you into the nature of their relationship in a way that you needed that challenge to, as a lens to get into. Yeah. To, to me it was a, a pattern recognition problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That there wasn't one pattern here, but a whole group of patterns with exceptions. Some of them interacted, some of them interfered with each other. But somewhere along the line, it could be sorted out. And the marginal mess that wouldn't fit anywhere, well, that led to nice narratives about the history of words. Right. So, <clears throat> I think we've also covered implicitly in, the, in our last question, what most interests you about orthography, because it's, in, it's part of the story of how you got there. Is there anything you'd add to that particular question? What interests you most now that you've arrived in this space? I, I look at the orthography perhaps as, as a tourist might look at a beautiful big city like Paris. I mean, here's a city laid out with Haussmann's wide boulevards converging in a circle at the Arc de Triomphe. But then you have a million side streets and dead-end alleys and other patterns that are there that intersect, interrupt, occasionally complement uh, that. And I see the same thing in, in the orthography. In the same way, the orthography has old and new. 
you know, we have all these new spelling patterns for words like inputted and formatted. We use letter names like x-ray in, in words. At the same time, we have good old Anglo-Saxon words like cow and sheep and raven and French borrowings in the same way that Paris has you know, the new Pompidou Center or the newly remodeled Pompidou Center, the other kind of new architecture along with the older parts of the city. Somewhat analogous to the human brain with these layers that grew on top of one just, another without it necessarily like having this uh, integrated uh, unfoldment. Yeah, which actually looks a lot like Paris. <laughs> you can start on the islands like, uh -huh. like the old brain uh -huh. and then build the city in, in districts around Eastmont, around it. Hmm. What are the, in my language, jewels of significance, you put it any way you want, but the things that are like the most important attributes, uh, most meaningful distinctions in the field of orthography, just top five or some limited number, not them all, the things that you think are most stand out as being really important? Well, I'd say maybe the first and most important thing is that the orthography is structured. It's not a chaotic mess. It's not this damnable collection of accidents and, and, and uh, historical uh, misreadings. But there really is a patterning there if you're willing to tease it out. But that patterning derives from the fact that we have 50-some sounds but only 26 letters. So we have to adopt a whole variety of mechanisms to close the gap. So one mechanism, very simply, is that we have two-letter and three-letter functional units. So if you want to understand how the orthography works, first you have to define what the minimal units are, what I call functional units. Things like TCH and DG and CH and SH, where you couldn't derive the sounds they have from the sounds of the constituent parts. It, that, that's as small as you can get. For those units. So that's, that's one factor. Another factor is that, like most Romance languages, we use what I call markers quite extensively. That is, they're letters like silent E, uh, like the U in guide, the doubling of consonants at the end of the word when you add something like ing, that themselves have no sounds usually, but point out how to pronounce something else. And some of the most pervasive rules depend upon that kind of knowledge. So that's, that's another component of the game. Another factor going back to these functional units is that some of them are what I call complex and some are simple. Now what that means is that things like DG and CK and TCH and even X you have a simple single letter vowel spelling before them, it's always going to be short, no matter what, because they operate as replacements for either two sounds like X or for a double spelling. CK is a replacement for KK, TCH is a replacement for old CH double, while things like SH and CH are simple. So a spelling like ache, A-C-H-E, the E signals a long vowel there, while something like X, A-X-E, the E, in fact, doesn't do much because the X is complex. So A is going to be short no matter what. So that's, that's another facet of the orthography. Another factor that, that has been pointed out for, oh, at least 200 years is that English, say, unlike Spanish, uh, Finnish, um, German, although German has a little bit of this, tends to preserve the meaningful, the spellings of meaningful units up to the point where translation to sound breaks down. So I'm sure you've heard others say, well, we have electric, electricity, sane, sanity. We keep the A even though it changes its sound value. 
preserve the morpheme or the meaningful unit. And, and English tries pretty hard to do that, but it messes up in, in, in a lot of places. But nevertheless, it's, it's a fairly modern principle. It really derives more from the 15th century, 16th century than it does from the older language. Is that a post-printing uh, press artifact? No, it's really, um, it comes roughly around the time that English is restored as the language of Parliament. And with that, with charters now being written in English, the chancery scribes begin to regularize spelling. And it was their choice, that is, the scribes attached to Parliament, to honor both etymology and this whole notion of preserving meaning, the appearance of meaning when they could. So there's a um, <clears throat> multivalence, there's a number of layers of um, structural units and their relationships to one another that is part of the pattern recognition system that's necessary to process this well and learning to read, and of course I'm learning to read. Yes, now don't, don't let me make it sound too complicated. I don't know that, that you haven't done that. I mean, it does sound a little complicated so far. Or, or let me let me put it in, in a slightly different term, mm -hmm. terms. It's not clear that one needs to teach all that to children for them to be successful as readers. That is, they certainly don't have to know that we honor etymology in, no. in, in what we do. They don't have to know much about simple and complex units, even though Perhaps by third grade, it's a useful thing for them to know if right. they haven't deduced it already. So that's an analysis that we might bring to understanding this thing on the other side of getting it, but not necessarily the path to learning it. Exactly. And this, this is always a problem that when you have on one side, say, analysis of a particular skill that you're interested in people acquiring, in this case, learning to translate from letters to sound, but then you have the whole psychological, pedagogical side. How much of this do we really need to teach? What's really essential? What sequence should it be taught in? Those are independent questions that have to be resolved through experience, through different kinds of study. Excellent. So how about a short tour of how, um, let me back up for a second. At one point in time, when the, at least back as far as the Greeks, uh, Plato even says in the Phrates that uh, once we knew the letters of the alphabet, we could read. The suggestion being, and there's others that suggest similar to this at different times in history, that um, reading initially with the alphabet that was underneath the development of written Western civilization, was a case of seeing these letters, responding with their sounds, and doing it fast and blending it together into a stream that sounded like we were talking. Code cued speech. <clears throat> In the case of the English language, it seems as if this code, which may have uh, degenerated in its correspondence before it got to England, but nonetheless was closer to correspondence between letters and sound, one-to-one. -one. Um, over a period of a thousand years or so, intermixes with this oral language, like you said in the beginning, there was 50-something. Some people say don't ever say more than 40, and some people say 44, and so you said 50, but there's a lot more sounds than there are letters. Right, it's dealer's choice. Dealer's <laughs> choice, exactly. Okay, so. There's this limited number of letters, which originally had a close to one-to-one -one correspondence, which then fused into this um, sound system of spoken English, and then evolved into where we are today from there. That point where they meet, and from there into some stability that you've now been able to identify with your pattern system. Let's talk about that window, how that happened, and uh, the history of that event. Let, let me try to give the 50 cent tour first. Very good. 
then we can go back if you want and, and elaborate on any of the pieces. Um, the first writing of English words, which occurs sometime perhaps in the early 700s, was done by scribes who were trained in Latin. Uh, these scribes probably were from the northern parts of England. They may have been Irish. A lot of the scribal, the graphemic forms were, were Irish forms. But the relationship of the letters they put down to sound for English clearly came from Latin. Latin, like English at that time, had long and short vowels, but no way to mark the difference. It had long and short consonants and cleverly doubled the consonants to show a long one and left them single to show short ones. But right from the beginning, English had a problem. English also had a lot of spirants and guttural sounds that Latin didn't have. And it took quite a number of years to find ways to mark those. And even when that occurred, by then they were beginning to change anyway. So right from the beginning, there wasn't a real good match between uh, spelling and sound. Um, but let, let me not give so much detail, but just jump ahead a little. For you, right there at that point, I mean, we are talking about the um, intersection, collision, if you will, of two different languaging systems, an uh, oral language with so many units and a written language that was kind of mapped or, or um, laid upon it or fused together with it that had an insufficient number of elements, even though despite the fact that there were certain commonalities relative to the vowels when you were speaking of. That, that seems like a, it's almost a unique, I mean, it's not a moment, it would be wrong to characterize that as a moment, but it's a, it's a unique juxtaposition of two different systems. And imagine now the people trying to fit them together, sometimes not being very good at speaking the language they were supposedly mapping into, and themselves perhaps not even hearing some of the differences. And certainly not aware of the implications thousand years later <laughs> on what this was going to do to, to the world. Yes, and, and you must not think of writing then in the same way that we do writing today. I'd say 95, 98% of everything we have from the early period of Old English is ecclesiastical records, gospels, uh, these were um, mostly church records or church materials to be read aloud. And a good percentage of them are nothing more than interlinear glosses. That is, here's the Latin manuscript, and then the English word written above the Latin one. So we get a very stilted Old English to begin with. There's a remarkable uh, document that comes from King Alfred's court when two travelers who had sailed way up north where the Finns were, related tales of uh, the icebergs they saw and how the Finns, when they died, the body would be kept on ice for six months while people would party every night and divide up the, the uh, estate, so to speak. It reads almost like modern English. Not quite. But when you finally get a glimpse of what English really sounded like in those times, which is not what you get from 95% of the other manuscripts, that's a whole different language, and it's the language we speak. As Otherwise, if this whole thing's got to come back to where, where it was in some ways. Yeah, so we're getting, sometimes with scribes, not always, but sometimes with scribes who weren't very good at speaking English, they're not really writing the English language. They're writing Latin. They're writing an aid to translating Latin into English. They're writing cues for themselves. Right. For their elite little group of uh, pronouncers that are going to be cued by what they're writing, yeah. rather than for the kind of general reading uh, that we can think of today. Later on, as, as cities begin to develop, we begin to get charters, we get other kinds of administrative records. Uh, I don't want to make it sound like all we ever get are the Psalms or, the, or Bible passages. But, but initially the writing is, is like it is when it starts to show up just about anywhere. It's instrumental. It's uh, relative to the logistics and record keeping and receipts and transactions. And its first movement beyond that isn't so much into literacy as it is into whatever the prevailing religion is. Yes. Now add to that. Okay. 
two other elements. England was settled originally by supposedly three different Germanic tribes, even though they, they clearly spoke the same language, but and it appears different dialects, or they developed them because of geographic isolation once they got to the island. So we have dialects that are reflected in the writing. On top of that, there's a huge amount of variation in how any given scribe tends to render certain vowels and certain consonants. I mean, as we were saying before, dealer's choice. So we have individual scribal variation, and then we have a dialect variation, and then we have this mismatch with the sounds and the letters. Now, it isn't until, I don't know, fairly late in the Old English period, when King Alfred, who was from West Saxon, Wessex, conquered a good part of England, defeated the Danes, drove them back, that there's any consolidation of English rule and therefore a movement towards kind of standardization of spelling, which comes almost in time for the Norman invasion. So we have this cycle of, of dissonance moving towards some kind of harmony, and then wham, here come the Anglo, the Normans. French now becomes the language of parliament, the court, of law. English now begins to be almost an underground language. No, not quite, but it begins to be that way. So the central authority is gone. The dialects become even more prominent. All the sound changes that had been occurring over the last 200 years begin to show up. The French scribes now begin to import French spellings for English words and do, do a reasonably good job and begin to move towards some kind of standardization. But then, <clears throat> excuse me, they lose their homeland back in France. They're no longer tied to any native French-speaking group. French begins to break down. English is coming back. By 1420, it's the spoken language of Parliament. Now we have a different group, this time, as I had mentioned before, these chancery scribes who are standardizing the language. Only they're as interested in showing etymology and meaning as they are for smoothing you know, tongue and glottis coordination. So now we have another cycle going from dissonance to, to harmony. That actually, within another hundred years, becomes pretty much what we see today. But with the establishment of the American colonies, and with independence, there is a movement to make American spelling different from British spelling. This is what Noah Webster led and quite a, a few other patriots. So spellings that were kind of optional, you could spell honor with an O-R or an O-U-R in England. Shakespeare probably has almost 50-50 in, in his writings. On our side, we went for O-R because on their side, they began to move towards O-U-R. So we have a now another kind of small split. Not, not a real big deal, but, but something of interest. Different uses of S and Z. You know, we can put I-Z-E on the end of everything. On, on that side, uh, you pretty well stick with S. Uh, some different pronunciations of words like, like schedule and so on. But not, not really a, a major difference. Now with the global economy, the internet, there is a very strong tendency for British spelling to get swamped out. American English, don't I? Yeah. More and more. What about the, I've heard from a number of linguists uh, that the, uh, the printing play, press played a role in this because the cost of, of creating um, new type, new fonts to represent the sounds, uh, the letters that had been previously handwritten um, was prohibitive. That they, that they used a narrower set and used that to represent uh, sounds that otherwise had distinct markers in handwriting. Uh, personally, I think the printing press is overrated from that standpoint. In terms of its influence on yeah. 
What about fixing the standards of whatever confusions or spelling issues even were? Even worse. Even worse. Yeah, I mean, take, take the case in England, for example. The first English printers, the first three of them, uh, Caxton, Vincent de Vord, and one other whose name I can't remember, who also worked for Caxton, they all worked in the Low Countries, spoke Flemish for 20 or 30 years before they came back to England uh, to print. I mean, Caxton was English, but had gone there. The others, I think, were born in the Low Countries. It was to their advantage, for example, to be able to put E at the end of the word or not put it there because they could justify lines more easily. Um, if you look in some of Caxton's earlier uh, works, you see that the city, Bruges, where he worked, he spells at least six different ways. There was really very little tendency in, say, the first 40 or 50 years, the Incunabula stage, for um, the English printers to impose any kind of standardization on spelling. The, the business about the letters has some truth to it. I mean, there were probably by the time of printing, by 1476, there were maybe two letters, uh, Ev and Thorn, that were still used in, in handwriting, although they were pretty much on their way out anyway. And for um, Thorn, for the most part, early on, Y was substituted. And that's where we get things like ye old choppy. I mean, it never was meant to be ye, it was always meant to be the. So when we pronounce it today with the ye, we're, we're, we're actually saying it differently than they would with right. that same spelling there. They would have said it the. Right. Well, that was a rather short lived substitution in T. It was a long lived uh, after effect. <laughs> Well, it's another part, by the way, that we really haven't talked about, okay. at some point we ought to get into, about English spelling, that one of the, I don't know if I really want to call it advantages, but, but let's use that word right now, then you can challenge it later. One of the advantages of the kind of variability we have is that you can use spelling as a personal marker, as a way of coming up with a distinctive name. So, for example, we have words like exon, where X is double, totally illegal, not allowed. They ought to go to jail for violating such a, a principle of English spelling. Sky vodka with two Ys. But then the use of things like um, these uh, homonym spellings. I stopped for a short vitamin drink at uh, the, this little bakery in the Union Station. And on the cup it says, all you need to know about the bakery or something, K-N-E-A-D. Uh, and you can find lots and lots of uses of, of these kinds of homonym spellings as, as ways of getting attention. Now, you can't do that very easily in Finnish or Turkish. Uh, let me say right now, um as we proceed here. By the way, I, I'm, I, I'm afraid I need to take a short break, so I'm going to pause in just a moment. But before we do that, just so that you and I kind of know where each other is coming from as we proceed here, um, I think there's been a number of really brilliant pieces of work that are kind of in defense of spelling because the, um, the lack of a rigid correspondence has created a creative opportunity the differentiation and experimentation and extension that has uh, that is fundamentally enabled a different kind of uh, verbal intelligent creativity in, in the minds of its users, and I am fully behind that. Terrific. Okay. I call these creative spellings in the chapter of my book where I talk about. Them. Yeah, my issue is not with that at all. I think this is perfectly right in that sense. My question is simply, what's the on ramp? For the child to mm -hmm. get up into it. It's a good question. That's where I am. And we're, that's where we'll go there and anywhere else you want to go. Just a moment. All Excuse right. me. Oops. I didn't take any powder. Do you want to check that? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Good. Thank you. Okay. So, if that established some leveling between us. Okay. Hmm? Good. Because um, I do appreciate that. that, that I am not, uh, I have a lot of people who. I'm bombarded with um, 
spelling reform proposals for consideration. <laughs> Bombarded. Books come in the mail. And, um, and I have conversation with spelling reformers. You must know Joe Little. No, I don't know Joe Little. I know Steve Bett and Donald Skagg in England and people that are part of the Simplified Spelling uh, Society. And I've certainly um, studied the history of attempts uh, somewhat. I mean, from Ben Franklin and Noah Webster, you mentioned, and Melville Dewey, and the, the grand 1880s to 1906 efforts, and the collapse of it all with Theodore Roosevelt's yeah. exuberance. And, and, and it's a fascinating story. It's, it's, but it's, uh, it's tugging on the wrong end of the elephant somehow. Oh, I think so. Um, Joe Little is the executive director of one of the Simplified Spelling Societies in New York. Oh. I'm surprised he hasn't come after you. I'm dealing with the, uh, the editor of the journal, International Journal, and, uh, and frankly, uh, I've kind of somewhat become discouraging. Of, I mean, my perspective is, we have to have a concern for the ecology of learning, and that 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 that, fo that a focus mm -hmm. on trying to um, uh, correct the problem by trying to change the spelling, you know, has historically gone down as folly relative to the inertia of what's established, and rightfully so in consideration in light of what we've been talking about about the creative enablement that's a con that's part of the system. There's that, and there's just the simple problem of getting any kind of agreement. I mean, the Dutch have gone through, I don't know how many reforms since World War II, and it's always more chaos added by the time some commi select committee releases its results. The battles start in the press. The same thing in Germany. Germany announced a whole group of reforms in 98. Within two years, an enormous number of people, editors, writers, announced that they refused to accept them. We're going back even further than, than the pre-98 spellings. As well, I do think we've got a problem. I just don't think that's where it lies. I mean, the attempts to fix it, it's so gone like this. Change the alphabet? No, we can't do that. Let's change the spelling. No, we can't do that. Let's reevaluate the alphabet. <laughs> it's gone bang, bang, bang. You know, with Franklin starting on the alphabet and Webster doing the spelling, and then Bernard Shaw and and, uh, and, and Mark Twain's guy turn coding in the middle on both issues at one time or another. And um, I think that, that there was some wisdom in all of this about this is this unnatural technology. This isn't natural. This isn't like learning how to do most of the things human beings learn how to do. It's a special case that has special demands. And we ought to find some way to make it as learnable as we can out of being careful stewards to the intellectual and psychological and other dimensions of development of our children. But that doesn't seem to be the approach. What, is there parts of this story, this part of this story that interests you that you can speak to? That any of this history of spelling reform or some place you want to go before we go? No. Now, I, some other time we'll deal with spelling reform. I, I, I agree with you that it's the wrong place to, to, to be barking. Uh, it's interesting, and you know, it's odd that Theodore Roosevelt went down in flames over such a small part of it. I mean, what he proposed was actually pretty reasonable, but it was well small. My understanding is, is that the, the national press stimulated by international press, and the whole thing's part of Congress gets involved, the Supreme Court gets involved, but the national press basically say, and this is what, what, what did it in, as I understand it, that um, this whole thing was a scheme by Carnegie. That's why I put the quarter of main bucks up, so that Carnegie, so that they'd have to reprint all these books and Carnegie would make money. Now, we know that wasn't the underlying motive, but that, had, that was a really powerful thing to lay on the country as a whole in the national press relative to the motivations behind it. Yeah, well, he took a real beating from the press, from Congress, and wisely withdrew within a few months all of the, the reforms. You know, I think uh, some say the only reason he got into it to begin with, like Darwin's involvement in the English version, was their, um, their shame at their own spelling skills. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I mean, he disguised it in part of his approach for international peace. 
was going to be part of the program to help everybody learn English better. Well, sure, you could say that, that that was one of the things that glued this together, is that the language imperialists could say, this is in the economic best interests of the planet because English is spreading all over the place and it's retarded by how difficult it is to learn. By making it easier to learn, it's in our economic and global imperialistic interests, quite independent of the argument for the well-being and educational efficiency of children. Right, and it even came down to occasionally that we would need less metal on road signs if we could reform the spelling and get rid of the silent GHs and so on. Uh, but anyway, that, I think that's for another another time. Yes. We took the short tour of the English spelling. Is there something you'd like to elaborate on that before we go on? Can... Is, was there anything that no, I, I sounded thought... particularly interesting? I actually gave you more than the 50 cents. You probably got okay. 75 cents to a dollar's worth. Okay. I think we touched on the positive benefits of our way of spelling. Would you like to reframe or... Frame? Both of us came to some... Yeah, let, let, me, let me deal with that for a few minutes. Good. Let, and let's take both the positive and the negative side, because I think that'll take us into learning to read, Good. learning to spell. The positive side of English spelling is that it serves the experienced reader well. So it takes longer to learn, which is the downside, to, to master. But... For the experienced reader, for we don't even have to talk about the speed reader, but just the average person reading silently. The fact we do try to preserve word meanings, common roots, keep the same spelling as far as we can, means that at a visual glance it's easier to see what the word is. That is, if we were changing the A and sane when we went to sanity, that's just a bigger load on comprehension on the actual word recognition. So the advantage is that it does seem to, even though we lack really good evidence, but it appears to facilitate the speed reader. Let me preface any other remarks, though, by one thing which I think will give you a sense of where I am on the whole reading issue. There are two big international studies done comparing reading in different countries over the last 12 years, 13 years. One in 1991, one just finished in 2001. Fourth graders and eighth graders were tested uh, in the 1991, I think, uh, 35, 40 countries participated. You want to guess where the United States came out? I mean, you could even do it just by quarters. By quarter, yeah. And were we in the lowest quarter, second lowest quarter, top quarter, next quarter? I would have said the second up from the bottom, I think. Okay, we were second in the world. <clears throat> we were beaten only by Sweden. Now, we were second to Sweden at fourth grade. And at eighth grade, we were in a group of countries that together were not significantly different from Sweden. So, one thing I think any honest person has to admit is that if you're only looking at average ability, if you're forgetting about the tail of the distribution, if you're forgetting about the fact we have more variants than any other country in the world, then the teaching of reading in America is terrific. There is no problem. So that's, that's where you've got to start that we're not talking about a national problem where all schools are terrible, that no one knows how to teach reading, that all kids are failing or not reading as good as they should. On an international comparative basis, we're second in the world at fourth and eighth grade. So like a lot of other educational systems in the country, we're kind of backloaded. We struggle harder in the beginning and we do this in K through 12, but we catch up in college. We don't have this marvelous teaching of college-like subjects in high school like you would find in Germany or France. But we have such a high percentage going on to college that within a few years, our average ability is above theirs. So what it leads me to is to say, we've got to be honest about where the problem is. 
problem is in inner city schools, in some rural schools, where we fail miserably, just miserably. And teaching to read is a serious issue in those places. But I don't want to give the impression that I think that it's a serious problem everywhere, because clearly it's not. Okay, let, let's go there. Good. I appreciate you setting this up. A couple of just technical questions to, to help right. get the sink about this. Um, was there kind of any, as part of this research study, was there any um, indexing against the amount of hours of instruction or dollars per child or? Is there, what other things were put into the mix to kind of contextualize the balancing of these? There, there was an attempt to account for instructional time, uh, parental, I think either education or income, uh, even, believe it or not, regularity of orthography was thrown in the mix. What's the name of the study? This is the International Education Association, IEA. Um, I think if actually if you asked IRAs people, if you asked Alan Farstrup, he would get you copies. Good. The study, the most recent one, which is called, um, I think they call it Pearls, P-I-R-L-S. You can pull down off the web. Good. And it references then the the earlier one. There's a, there's a number of international studies. The most recent one was on uh, Dr. Pascaliu in Italy. It was behind. BBC did a big thing on it a couple of years ago. Um, that are showing that there, the highest incidence of dyslexia is associated with English orthography. Yes, I did see that. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that. Um, what you can say is that in the United States, we have the highest percentage of kids labeled learning disabled as any place in the world. And a good part of that is an economic employment thing. In the same way, we give out more pills per person than any other country in the world, do more bypass operations. Um, our screen sensors are further out extended, yeah. and so we're, we're, we're labeling more things with more differentiation than anybody else. Right. We give more tests. Right. We, we create more categories. So, so let's pull back then and go to the whether or not there's a reading problem in the country, yeah. right? having left the international comparative scene. Is, is that I understand and appreciate what you're saying, um, but look, let's, let's stay here for a moment. Um, It seems from an academic, I mean, there are people that, that have done research that says the uh, first year, by the end of the first year of school, how well a child learned to read can predict how well they will be as they exit high school, whether they'll go on to college. I, yesterday, speaking of the uh, IRA, I interviewed Dr. Leslie Morrell. She mentioned there are states in this country that based on first grade literacy tests project how many prison cells to build for that state. I would be a little suspicious of that. But I... She said it's a fact. She actually ex extra hammered it. I'm not asking you to verify it. I'm just trying to say that there, is some, there are some people um, for the, as you're sure are aware of the NAP results, that, right. that, that national averages, 68% of fourth graders are less than proficient. 60% of 12th graders. Well, you have to keep in mind that these labels, proficient, uh, okay, or whatever the hell they are, basic, are totally arbitrary. That They don't correspond to anything in the real world. In fact, there's a whole commission working on trying to refine them and make them more accurate. Um, in the same way, when you look across states and you see which ones have high percentages and which ones have low percentages passing the state test, we have in Mississippi 80%, I think, of fourth graders supposedly proficient in reading, 
but when you look at the National Assessment of Educational Progress, what you see is something like 20%, while on the other hand, Wisconsin, which has much, much higher standards, and Delaware, interestingly, have more kids proficient by the National Assessment than they do by their state test. So there, there's a lot of wiggle room to set standards. What, what, I, what I don't want to mislead you on is I'm not saying there isn't a reading problem. What I'm trying to do is put the reading problem in perspective. That, that just like fighting a war, you, you, you want to know where the enemy is, who the enemy is, and concentrate your fire on the enemy. And going after the grade schools in Shaker Heights and trying to force them to give more tests and change the way they teach reading when the average kid is in the 80th percentile. We know that certain <coughs> uh, the frequency of verbal distinctions in the oral world before um, beginning to read. There's a lot of things that more advantaged children are exposed to right. that contribute significantly to the probability that they're going to take off and read. So we know that when we talk about a national average, this is not uniform. This is all over the place and moving in relation to these socioeconomic distinctions. Right. That's why I say, yes, on, on average, we're doing a real good job, but we have the biggest variance. And the lower end of that distribution tail is where our problem is. And that's where, if we really want to help kids, we've got to focus. And there the code becomes very important, as I'm sure you've heard over and over, and over yeah. and over again. Well, let's, let's transition into that conversation. Um, if you're content that we're moving together, I mean, I, yeah. I, I feel good about this. I understand where, where you're at and uh, appreciate that. And, and we are not trying to advocate some universal massive problem that uh, everybody's got. But we are trying to say it's a, a significant challenge that how well a child learns to read is a significant influence over how their life unfolds. It's probably the biggest factor. And it would be hard to identify something else for the average child. Now, granted, there's, you get above a certain level and then the differences aren't going to make a huge uh, predicted prediction about earnings or happiness or anything. But we all know that if you don't get up to some reasonable level, you're in serious trouble. I think that's, that's pretty safe to say. I mean, it's, it's both in terms of academic, academic success, economic success, and psychological well-being. Right. So, Inside that space, however big it is, however it is that it's distributed in the world in this country, okay. um, we have millions of children whose lives are shaped or misshaped by the challenge and struggle they experience in the process of learning to read. And this learning to read process is not a natural process like speaking. We know, we know whether you take the uh, genetic approach or the anthropological approach or whatever angle you want to come in on it, that we've been speaking for a while and we've got wiring that kind of supports us doing it. We haven't been reading for long enough for the wiring to be innate for us to do it. It's a learned uh, process that's in relation to a man-made, artificial, external, con technological contrivance. Right. And this, how well <clears throat> somebody is able to master this external technological contrivance can shape their entire lives. So that's that's okay. our rabbit hole for next stuff. Yeah? All right. Good. Let's go ahead and change tapes at this point. Okay. Okay. Uh, I realized that Ed Worthy went to the edge of quantum physics theory or mythological interpretations or historical interpretations or anthropology or wherever you went. You okay on time? Yeah. I'll be quick. You asked the question. Um, <laughs> we know where the blame is, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> there was a raging debate. So on the one hand, our society is pumped with it is so, and at the living edge of what we know, there's a raging debate about what's true. 
So the authority of it all kind of broke down in me, and I became much more interested in learning than in knowing. And that took me on a track where I, I really synced up with, the, with children. They try to feel what they feel as they're struggling to learn. And along the course of that, after many years of just studies about learning, watching it first person and in children, as well as externally learning about it, um, I encountered bright children who were struggling to learn to read. And until I actually was coming from a learning lens, and empathically resonant with them as they were in the struggle, I had never thought about it at all. Mm. Once I did, um, and started to see the psychological consequences of their struggle, how quickly they went into various kinds of difficulty themselves, I'm starting to feel like I'm stupid, what's wrong with me because I can't do this. That's kind of what inspired all of this. All right. It's a good story. <laughs> <clears throat> so I think we come to this point where we're in the space of uh, we, we have a problem. It's not everybody's got the problem, but some people have a problem. Enough people have the problem, and it's so life-shaping that, it, that it's all of our problem. We should think about it. And as children are learning their way into this, they're coming from an oral language world, which they're wired up, they brilliantly learn, not without struggle, but, but they do. Um, we show them almost from the time they're in the crib, these isolated letters. This is an A, and this is a B, and this is a C. Some, some parents do. Huh? Some, some parents, parents okay. Well, okay. We could go somewhere between some and most and talk about all that stuff. But to some degree, um, isolated letters, as if they're discrete and have relatively stable singular sounds children are exposed to. Sesame Street prompted them on other people. Right. right. And then at some point, they start to read, start to the process of learning to read. And in the process of learning to read, they encounter a challenge that nothing in evolution has prepared them for. Let's talk about that. All right. Let's, let's create uh, a little bit of a framework for it. Please. Let's pick up on something you said earlier to start with. <clears throat> for learning to read, if we're just simply interested in what, what's going to make a difference, why is it that little Sally over here doesn't learn to read and Joe over here does learn to read? All right, we know that the language the child brings to the classroom is, is one critical element. Those children who grow up in a facilitative language environment who are encouraged to ask questions and think about the future, who have everything labeled for them at, at 13 months of age, we, we know they have an advantage. And we have lots of really good research on that phase of, of the problem. So one, one category, area, component, is the language and the prior experience the child is bringing. And we can throw into that, some children get a lot of book experience, some don't. Some by two years of age are already opening pages of books and identifying animals and so on. And some never see a book till they're four or five. So that's, that's one part. And that goes on because that means there's people in the home who are going to continue to facilitate learning. So that's, that's one component. Another component is some schools have lots of money, have good superintendents, good principals, and we'll get to teachers in a minute. Clearly, they're going to be very important. But have their act together. So if you go out on Long Island, you'll have communities that spend $21,000, $23,000 per child compared to, I suspect, Four to five thousand dollars in South Los Angeles, in in South Milwaukee, and places like that. The average in the country is a little over eight. So we have nearly three times as much money available per child in some communities, and that's going to make a big difference. That means they're going to be more reading specialists, more English as a second language people, smaller class size, 
more library materials, all, all the things that have some bearing on the problem. Now we get down to the core of things, the teacher and the approach to reading. And I, to begin with, I don't want to take them apart because we can have a brilliant approach to reading and a poor teacher and the net result is going to be the same as a real good teacher with a really bad approach to reading. Now, maybe we'd get a little advantage with a better teacher and a bad approach, but it isn't going to help us with the kids who need a lot of help. So we have, we have to realize that those factors are going to make a difference. We're not going to go into the city of Chicago, for example, and just by teaching them to handle the code better, change overnight how well kids learn to read. Because first, it's dangerous to be in most of the neighborhoods where some of the schools are in Chicago, particularly on the south side. The teachers there are, tend to, if they're any good, they tend to get out as quickly as they can and get to the suburbs where the pay is higher and the conditions are better. So that's the framework I want to start with. Now I want to get down to the code. My humble opinion is the problem with learning the code is not really with the code, it's with the teaching of the code. We have long periods in the history of reading instruction in America where the code wasn't taught or was taught in such a um, boring, offensive, or um, misleading way that it didn't do much good. Or we can even be more extreme and say it probably was a negative factor. Drilling kids to death on letter sound correspondences probably is as bad as ignoring them in some cases. I don't think it's quite as bad. I think I'd prefer the former to the latter, but it's still not our ideal. So the first problem that I see is that it's difficult to find a time where the code was seriously taught. And I, I can't explain why it is that even today there is such enormous resistance, even among, and especially among, the college faculty who teach the reading methods courses to deal with the code. And what does deal with the code mean as you're saying it? It really means understanding it, understanding the instructional options, training teachers to diagnose code-related competencies and to know, to have the same bag of tricks they have for interesting kids in literature. <clears throat> My understanding is that <clears throat> between the time that our eyes scan a letter and we virtually hear or actually speak this stream of thought and words, there are many layers of complex processing that all have to synchromesh with pretty cool critical timing to assemble this virtual thought stream, this code-driven thought stream. That, <clears throat> as, as is pretty evident, almost all of our children can see a letter and say it sound, the letter name, the ABCs. They, they learn that 99% <clears throat> pop. No problem. It's like naming dog and cat and shoe. That's a hey, that sounds like a name. Right. Not a problem. When we put these things together, compress them next together, so they must be spoken, read in sequence. The rules change. They're no longer the sound that they were. And again, some kids aren't taught that association. A lot are. But once they're put together, they definitely have different sounds depending on their arrangements together for all the reasons that you were talking about when we began than they do when they're isolated and separate. There's not an immediately, intuitively, naturally obvious relationship between that letter and its sound. It, each letter or letters have a field of potential sounds 
they might sound like, depending upon the other letters that are before or after it. Sometimes letters, words down the row yet. Well, all right, let, no. me, let me try to make it easier. Good, please. Because I think you're making it sound much more difficult than it really is. Uh -huh. We have lots of evidence that in spite of all the concern now with phonemic awareness, that the average child, I'm not talking about the one or two percent at the bottom who truly have dyslexic tendencies or can be classed that way. But the Biological average, deficits yeah. is distinct from learning, learned learning difficulties. We know children can learn ind individual sounds attached to some visual object. They learn that the snake goes, when you open your mouth for the doctor, you say, ah, and the tap may go duh, 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 or whatever, or the typewriter or whatever. That's not clearly not an overly difficult task for a child. We know furthermore that children don't really have much in the way of problems with learning variant responses to the same stimulus under different environmental conditions. So they know you go to bed every night at 8, except when grandma visits. You know you can use a glass at the sink, except when mom has all her dishes or things in, and then you're not supposed to run the water or whatever. So it isn't the variability in the orthography that, that appears to be the problem. We don't have a lot of evidence from reading. We do from spelling, but not from reading. That, for example, learning that um, A in mat is short, A, and when there's an E at the end of mat, it's mate. We don't have much evidence that would say that's a big problem for children. We do have evidence to say, however, that if you don't teach it, a lot of the kids aren't going to learn it. They're not going to extract it automatically from just being exposed to work. Some kids do. So suggesting that, that we need to help them um, differentiate this confusion. Right. We've got to we simplify it for them. Mm -hmm. And then we've got to introduce them to the complexities in some rational way. The same way we do with the number system. With Basic but math the, the difference between math and spelling is that there's time to volitionally think about these things. In the case of reading, in order for this letter translation to result in this projected stream virtually heard or actually mm -hmm. spoken, that assembly process has to happen faster than they can consciously, volitionally participate in. When we talk about a number of different letters that are work, that, that are not clear as to what sound they're supposed to make. That process of disambiguation, I'll come back and you can attack that in a minute. That process of working this out has to happen at incredible speed compared to these other feats that you've just described. Let's talk about it in terms of the, the timing criticality of this process. When you look at eye movement studies, when you look at the reading speed data, you see a very predictable progression. A beginning child may make three, four fixations on a word, may fixate on every single letter. By the middle of the year, there may be two fixations per word. And clearly by third or fourth grade, they're reach, beginning to reach near adult scanning behavior. They're still making more fixations per line. And, of course, their speed will go up and up. This is for good readers? This is for, a, say, an average reader. Okay. Now, what about for a, for a reader that's struggling? For a reader who's struggling, getting beyond these multiple fixations per word. So why are, they multiple, why are there multiple fixations per word? Well, that's, that's part of one of the grand mysteries. Doesn't that, do you think, that, is it worth entertaining that that's because there's multiple confusions per word that they're not able to work out? Well, it would be certainly more plausible if we could find that we never saw that in, say, a language like Turkish that has a near one-to-one -one relationship 
So if all you learn is one sound for every letter, you have everything you need. So let me let me make your your argument a little stronger, and then let me come back and deal with it. What's got to go on during reading is not only getting the letters in and getting either sounds attached to them if it's not something that's visually familiar, or accessing visual memory or some other encoded memory that doesn't require sound, and retrieving then the meaning. And if you're reading orally, retrieving the pronunciation. Are you suggesting that some children um, learn to read by passing the uh, virtual no. pronunciation? No, but let's take okay. let's let's begin let's begin with the fourth grader. Let's begin with the fourth. We're four years down the road of learning to read. Yeah, and then come back. Let's okay, right. let's take a fourth grader. Fourth grader reading silently is probably going to recognize ninety percent of the words in a text from just the printed form. Is not going to decode them. Not going to pronounce anything, whether it's subvocal, vocal, or anything else. Fourth grader is going to read a fourth grade text basically silently. When you say silently, you're saying that they are not having a virtually heard experience? Right. Exactly. So doesn't that vary across the spectrum of different processing styles? I mean, I still hear words when I read in a virtual sense. Yeah, you're be careful with introspection. No, no, I'm not, I, I, I don't mean to generalize from there. I'm just saying that I'm an exception myself, and most of the people I talk to are on a spectrum. Well, one, one piece of evidence is that fourth grade is roughly the point, even though it's happening more and more third, towards the end of third grade now, where reading speed for silent reading overtakes that for oral reading. And that's one clue that they're not articulating the words, because if they were, even in a subvocal way, it would be difficult to be reading much faster because mm -hmm. articulation Agreed. rate. Yes, in fact, one of the whole things that we're doing is look at what's the uh, frequency range of oral language distinctions and how is it this reading system starts up, goes right. through it, and goes beyond it. But even if you don't want to agree at fourth grade, take sixth grade, eighth grade, at some point people are reading silently. Yes, and transcending it being limited to the frequency of oral language. And furthermore, if they're reading out loud, they're recognizing the words visually and retrieving full articulatory programs for the words, just like they speak. They're not decoding letter by letter when they're reading orally. All right. How is it possible, then, that the child in the beginning who doesn't recognize anything can go from reading out loud to reading silently? What, what we know has to happen is that more and more of the words become familiar and are digested as whole words. We know one of the earliest things that begins to happen, and we can kind of project downward from the brain research, is that you actually build up areas of the brain that specialize in detecting word-like things. That is, if you look at the research where people are shown um, made up letters from components of letters, but they're no longer letters, versus consonant strings, versus pseudo words that follow English orthographic patterns, versus words, the latter two categories for some tasks are processed in one area of the brain and the first two somewhere else. Even consonant strings are not. That is, they're immediately recognized very early in the visual perceptual processing as non-words. And they're shunted off to, to other areas of the brain. So somehow, we are developing not just letter sound coding in the brain, but we're developing all of that orthographic kind of scribal regularity so that we can begin to recognize larger units than letters. And one hypothesis is that, all right, we go from separate letters to groups of letters to whole words. And with the whole words, the child is then released from the phonological 
requirement? Absolutely. My, my understanding of all of this is that, um, and this was kind of what led to the error of the whole language reading instruction movement, is that the average proficient reader is reading at a whole word level. That they're, they're right. able to scan, pick up cues in the patterns. And, and by the way, when we make mistakes, it's because we missed the strategy of, of recognizing that word. We missed the recognition of the word as a whole. Some, some letter combination that normally leads one direction didn't in this particular case, and it causes a dropout and so forth. But that as adults, as proficient readers, yeah, we recognize words as a whole. We're not, we're not struggling to decode them at an elemental level. However, the question is, how is it that we learn to do that? Okay, one reasonable hypothesis is that the biggest function of decoding is to force the learner to pay attention to all the letters in the word. That rather than guessing from context in the sentence and length of the word and first and last letter, that by learning to decode, the person is learning to attend to all of the functional units within the word. So one function of decoding goes beyond just simply getting the sound of the word. And it's what helps build up that visual recognition, that understanding of scribal regularity, that kind of abstracted impression of the word that helps you then build up this automatic recognition and then begins to allow you to read faster. Now, how do you get there? Well, one thing you've clearly got to learn is a set for flexibility. You've got to learn that if you're looking at, let's say, sane, and you first say san, and that doesn't make any sense for the context, you've got to change something and try again. That letters have some variability. Vowels vary much more than the consonants. There are clues that you might be looking for in the word. So part of the teaching of decoding is teaching this set for variability. And it comes sometimes with great difficulty for certain kids. Just to come all the way back to where we started kind of in a certain way. Um, you originally started off with a kind of uh, hesitation on the word ambiguity. Right. In, in, in my work, the word, my use of the word ambiguity would come right into where we are now with respect to the variability. And how is it the variability goes from what's possible complex to what's actual in order to make this recognition happen. Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it ambiguity. It's not a bad term. It's certain, certainly acceptable. But for the first place, there are patterns that are simply complex. They're not ambiguous in the true sense of the word. We could then say ambivalent, because the, the experience is ambivalence. Well, I'm not sure I'd even want to say that, because okay. we, that's making an implication of how these things are handled. Take a word like city. Mm -hmm. You come to the initial C. C at the beginning of the word, with one or two exceptions, Italian borrowings, before E, I, or Y is sought like city. Now, there's nothing ambiguous about it. If it's before one of those letters... If you don't know those rules, when you encounter the C, ah. it's ambiguous. Well, sure. Well, that's the whole point. We're always talking about the child's perspective struggling to learn to read. But the orthography is not ambiguous. But it admits... No. Okay. But furthermore, the child, rather than learning a rule, we have no evidence they really learn rules, could simply be learning to look at C plus the next vowel as a unit and know that C-I, C-Y, C-E, like ceiling, you always start with the soft C. It could be that they're matching up to other words that they have in memory. That is, we don't really know that people form rules. In fact, most of the evidence would militate against the, the existence of rules that are applied during reading, as opposed to some kind of... Um, matching against known samples, some kind of larger units. And perhaps. all of this, of course, is some kind of a 
adult-centric, uh, analytic overlay to whatever is the natural brain processes that's stretching into doing this, which may not behave. These are ways to describe it, but not necessarily. It's yeah. nature. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we simply don't know. I mean, if you look at um, speech recognition and where that's moving these days, it seems that a lot of the theories there could be applied to reading. That is, there's a sense that the recognition of a word in speech depends upon how many words are close to it. The more words that are close to it, the harder the job of discriminating. The fewer words that you could create, say, by changing one sound at a I'm time. I'm surprised the difficulty with ambiguity. In, in computer uh, terminology, when there's many different variables that need to collapse to a particular value to insert into a, uh, the output stream of a particular sequence, I call it disambiguation. But remember where we we're applying this. My point is, it's not the orthography it's ambiguous. The orthography is complex. The orthography is, in certain cases, erratic. It's the child's job now, or our job in teaching the child, to teach the child that there are ways to figure out how to pronounce letters, rather than teaching the child, well, it's uncertain, you'll never know, just try everything. Oh, of course. So. My only point is that I don't want to label the orthography as ambiguous. There are pieces you could pull out and say, that's ambiguous. We would, there no way, there's no way to figure out, for example, if you have a brand new word, there's no way to figure out how CH is pronounced. So you wouldn't say that the relationship between letters and sounds, generally, in the English language is ambiguous? No. I would say there are ambiguous components to it. And you say that because it's possible to systematically map their relationships. Right. Because there's a way of analyzing them as an analyst, as an adult who's facile and masterful right. with this, looking back upon it, that can make a map that says, well, from this vantage, this isn't ambiguous at all. Right. But now, let me not overstate yes. the regularity. We don't mark stress. When you get to longer words, stress is truly ambiguous. But you can begin to try out different stress patterns if your task with decoding is to get close enough to a word you already know from listening to figure out what the word is. But just so far as the segmental units are concerned, yes, they're ambiguous pieces, but the system overall has a lot of regularity. Could we say that though the system isn't ambiguous, as viewed, from an adult masterful view of the system, that the challenge to the child at some level could be described as being overwhelmingly ambiguous. Well, let's take another step. Okay. Leonard Bloomfield, mm -hmm. the father of structural linguistics in America, wrote a reading program for teaching his children how to read. And he simply began with only the most regular words, the non-ambiguous words. And he moved through to the more complex patterns. And I, I honestly don't know then how he began to bring in the marginal mess. But you can teach kids that way. That is, anybody writing a decoding program is clearly going to start with the most decodable words possible. The decoding ceilings that are talked about so often, and the idea of a graduated um, unfoldment of the confusions. Right, and these, what I think are silly arguments over should you only use decodable text early in teaching reading. Uh, well, my sense of that, which we're just <laughs> stimulating our very rich conversation, is no. I, I, yes, we should have some concern that we're not stretching beyond, but we should intentionally set up these kinds of confusions, intentionally direct I, I the learner's mind into a, to a isolated, clear confusion and help them deal with it. 
move from there into ever greater complexities of confusion, building on a stairway where we've directed their confusion rather than left them alone floundering in it. Right. That's what good instruction is all about. Leading in, in an appropriate way that's not in such small steps that it becomes boring, but not such big steps that it becomes unattainable. Right. Cycle of engagement demands maintaining the affect of interest in order to engage attention and that we have this stretch between what's relevant and what's boring that we've got to stay in the center of. Yeah, and not to fear the child struggling all the time. No, in no, fact, I don't mean all the time struggling. But if they don't, they don't struggle, there's no learning. If there, wasn't, if, there was, if there wasn't some confusion, there's no stretch. We tried program learning once mm -hmm. in this country, where all learning was broken down into little tiny steps with the theory that the child should never make an error because Skinner's learning theories yes. had no place for errors. Right. You could only reinforce the correct thing. Oh. So well, you and I both know from our own experiences that the, our greatest learnings come from the frustration of wanting to overcome the things that are confusing us, what's most difficult, what's most challenging. They come from that, and they come from having to redo things, Yeah. to reflect on what we've done, and then they have to redo it and improve it. That, that's where I think the majority of learning, almost in any task, takes place. I mean, think of the use of videotaping in learning tennis. I mean, what are you doing but reflecting on what you're doing and now redoing it and trying to improve it? The same way when you write a paper that the teacher hands back with the comments. There's probably not a lot of learning that takes place in the original writing but a huge amount in the rewriting. Depending on how um, self-reflexive you are with respect to what you're writing. Yeah. Assuming you're the whole point, in fact, the argument uh, brought up by many is, is that it is this writing and reading process which stretches our ability for uh, distinction and self-reflection that's what's lifted us in civilization. In some sense, reading is the ultimate re reflective process. You've got to be monitoring what you're doing and correcting it as you go, or you're in trouble. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. I feel um, content myself, but I also want to say, I'd also like to invite you to speak to anything you think that's important in this space that we haven't touched on. What, what I think we haven't spent time on, but I'm not so sure how important it is, is how to deal with the different kinds of patterns, problems there are in the orthography. But maybe, maybe that's too much detail. I, there's another whole track of me and our work that's entirely focused there. And, I, and if, if you're interested in it, I would like to consider this the first step in an ongoing conversation in which perhaps you and I, by phone and email and otherwise, can exchange a little bit more and see if we can sync up on that conversation. Because I'm very interested in that. I mean, ultimately, this has got to get from the kind of level of discussion that we're having to something that's practical and concrete. There's other dimensions of this that we haven't talked about, like the relationship between affect and cognition and the processing, right? And what parents can do. And all of that. that right. Those kinds of things. There, there's an enormous mystery about how the leap is made from the typical kind of decoding practice that goes on in, say, first and second grade, and dealing with really long words, four or five syllable words, constitutionality, and so on. It's sort of the the, the gray, the syllabic segmentation, dark land of the intricate uh, borders. And yeah. They pick up that. Many programs just give up at that point. Many teachers have no idea in the world what to do with, with those kind of words. But that's what seems to distinguish the kids who continue to stay on the fast rising curve beyond, say, third and fourth grade, and those who don't. Yeah. This corresponds to what we were saying before, which I totally agree with, by the way, that this process of decoding isn't to, 
I mean, for for example, in the case of a Chinese person trying to learn to read English, the fact that English, that decoding English doesn't lead to a pronunciation that lets them, you know, say the word is is very problematic. But in our case, all the decoding got to do is to a native oral language speaker of English is to is to boost enough of it into recognition to get captured. Exactly. It doesn't have to be a complete assembly, but it has to get close enough for comprehension to grab it coming up from this decoding engine. Right, and that's why one shouldn't make such a big deal of words that aren't completely decodable. There may be one letter that will be problematic, but with the, even without that or with the, any reason. This is the benefit guess, of the meaning cues, because the meaning cues are giving you a sense of how this might relate to the meaning of other works that you do know, even if it is uh, phonologically confusing. The, the way I think about recognizing a word is that you have all these parallel tracks of information that are converging, and they have different time constants. So the visual stuff comes first. But if for any reason it takes you too long visually, there's hesitation, you're not sure, other information can get there, the contextual information, the phonological information, and your job is to integrate all that stuff and make a decision. All unconsciously fascinating to think about. Exactly. I think of that as, as the co-implicate convergence of all of these different processes informing this catch into comprehension. Right. And where the visual stuff normally gets there quick enough right. and resolves the problems, or at least makes you feel like you've confidently made a recognition. The, the, the only thing about the decoding in the beginning is that in that, between the ABCs and word recognition, yeah. there is this necessity to pass through reasonably enough this process of decoding so that the decoding just becomes one subsystem in this multitude of systems that can feed into comprehension. And that without it, it seems that that's that. Yeah. Could very well be that by starting the kid with sight words, the and of, of the whatever, you're giving the child those words that occur so frequently enough in the text that they can have time to decode the other words and still feel like they're reading. That is, if they had to decode every single word, letter by letter, that would be, and have the potential to, to have them forget words before they could integrate them into anything meaningful. Right, but we, the decoding is only kicking when um, the confusion is not allowing the word to pop into comprehension within a certain flow rate and time. Right? Right. Right. Meaning the visual part doesn't kick it in. Right, but, but, the, so, but the, the, it's not that we don't want to be visually recognizing and bypassing the circuit, but the key to visual recognition, you don't already have it, has to be by working the letters. Right, but it also means repeated exposures. Right, but to, what's the point of the repeated exposures? What you said before about, I mean, it, it's as if um, we're talking about, uh, whether we're talking about phonemic, phonemic awareness or we're talking about decoding, we're talking about making uh, ever higher frequency, more granular, more dimension at once distinctions. But I'm, no, I'm, I'm agreeing with you that I'm trying to turn to instructional options. Yes. If you have pure decoding, if all you're going to do is start the child off and teach letters and sounds. And Absolutely. We're trying. Just try to work through uh, short sentences that way. It probably is not the optimal way to work in decoding, as opposed to teaching, say, at least in parallel, enough sight words more familiar words in English that, that the child has more motivation. This is the integrated approach that's starting to emerge. Of, of, uh, I mean, we know from uh, California and other states the massive negative implications of being of the assumption that if we just teach them a bunch of uh, sight words, that somehow they'll figure out the code stuff. I mean, it's a hard crash in the third or fourth grade that, that, that hurt a lot of children. 
By the way, that's another issue to pick up yes. some other time. Yes, what's that? The so-called fourth grade slump. Uh-huh, okay. Because my take on that has a lot to do with the fact that we overemphasize narrative fiction for teaching reading in grades one through three. And in fourth grade, the child suddenly has to read a social studies book and a math book and a science so book. So there's a missing variable, you're saying, in the, way, in, the, in the conclusion process we're drawing, that there's a number of things that are in this transition point. It's not just... Well, it's, we're, we're being misled by the test, mm -hmm. by performance on a narrative text where you can learn probably by the age of three what the story grammar is for the text. You know, the story has a beginning, some problem stated, some characters, some crisis later on, some intervention to resolve the crisis. So here so, again, what we're saying is that there's no relevancy bridge right. between these two different domains. And so we hit this, um, we make these arbitrary, well, at this stage you should be able to do this, and we're running into walls that we're not recognizing. We're not, we're not exposing kids to enough of the kind of challenging text, the non-fiction ones like directions, where getting even one word wrong may put you in the river rather than in the, the library. The criticality of what you're comprehending is an entirely different level. Right. It's less forgiving and that there's, Much no, less forgiving. there's no graduation between these two. It's too hard of a threshold and it happens to, to coincide at the same point we're measuring this uh, whole language crash point. Yeah, it's almost like they're two different types of reading. Yes, I, I hear what you're saying. I think that's a, it's a really good. I hadn't put my mind in that space before, but now that you say it, it's really clear. And if you think about the purposes of them, then it becomes more extreme, because why are we teaching narrative fiction? Well, so they go on and enjoy themselves. Well, it's a training book. It's the idea that the greater the interest the greater the entrainment of attention, the greater attention span, the greater the likelihood that they'll be able to get into this whole reading thing. And it could very well be why about 80% of the kids who are labeled as reading disabled are boys. Because the kind of stories they use appeal much more to girls than to boys. I know my daughter came home with a book on baseball and I just had a hemorrhage over it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's great. Yeah. I think that's terrific. How old is she? Well, at the time she was six. That's wonderful. Because yeah. the teachers we observe would never allow a baseball story for six-year-olds. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the point. It's just all confused. Dr. Pinesky, thank you so much. It's been a wonderful pleasure to, to engage with you and have this conversation. It's my pleasure. I look forward to having more conversation with you. I don't even know where to find you. May I Good. jump in? Yeah, I please. Have, what you guys are describing, this um, change in what they're reading, I kind of see this as what we have, well, from kindergarten to third grade, we're teaching learning to read, right? And then we switch over to this reading to learn. Right. These are kind of the buzzwords of describing it with no relevancy bridge in between. I don't know, that just jumped out. That's a, that's a good added distinction. Yeah. I think that does overlap exactly what we were describing. It brings in the lingo of the day as to what yeah. the barrier yeah. distinction mm -hmm. is. Another question is, you mentioned earlier that we have no evidence that, that the children are applying these rules that we're teaching them right. while reading, right? But they wouldn't even need to apply these rules if they weren't getting confused while they're reading, right? There would be no need for these rules if they weren't stuttering on the confusions. Which, but there, there's no way that we can, or, or I shouldn't say no way. I'm looking for a way that we could possibly test this when they're talking, when they're silent reading. Okay? They're, they're not going to, um, you know, in class, just break out and sing the song, well, when two bells go walk, yeah, you know, first one, well, like which is like, that out. one really, and I know, <laughs> it's good, that good. one has stuck in my head more than anything. It was a show that I saw on PBS. So th this is a rule that I think the kid might be trying to apply while reading, but how can we even get into that? Because once we get into that, to me, that's evidence of this lull in the distinction of time and precarious processing. 
it, their brain is actually stepping out of the decoding process and going into this other loop of integrating these rules that we're, ta we're teaching them. And it's really obvious right there that that's got to take time to step out. So I'm wondering how could we, how could we possibly set up to, to get this out of there? Well, let me, let me give you two, two, two examples. We did some experiments once on whether kids knew the different pronunciations of C, mm -hmm. the letter C. So we had, we made up words, C-I-P and so on, M-E-C-A-L, and they were asked to pronounce them or we had a multiple choice kind of thing where they saw that that was the letter that we're interested in and then they had to choose from matching words where there's a k or a s or a sh or whatever. And we tested first through uh, third grade. Mm -hmm. And they did horribly on the soft C. Their textbooks all had a rule for soft C, but oddly, all of the words that were called the vocabulary words for the first three years, of the 103 that had initial C, about 100 had K, and three had S. So the first thing we saw from that was that even if you teach a rule, if you don't have enough exemplars, mm -hmm. then you're clearly not going to get rule behavior of any kind, whether it comes from the rule or extracting the pattern. On the other hand, when you're teaching spelling, there are certain rules that you can observe the spellers actually applying. I before E except after C? Well, that, that's one. That's actually a little more esoteric than I was saying. I was okay. thinking more of when you drop a final E, when you retain it, when you double a final consonant. Mm -hmm. And you can see people stopping if you watch them while they're spelling. Sometimes they'll even start saying the rule. Now, granted, spelling is not reading. Spelling can be done at a much slower pace. Mm -hmm. But for a child, let's say, who's read the first part of a sentence, come to a strange word with C in it as, as the first letter, I'm not sure that the length of time it would take if they knew the rule well to apply it would be so long that it would disable decoding because otherwise they may try out two or three pronunciations before they're satisfied. Mm -hmm. And that's what kids do, by the way, the better decoders. They might look at a word like CIP and say, whisper to themselves, keep, keep, sit, and then go on. Mm -hmm. In that, in that delay, though, doesn't that cause some retention problems in the children? Yes. But it doesn't appear that uh, they're disabling. A kid read, reading at 60 words a minute somehow is getting meaning from a text. 40 words a minute is getting meaning from a text, on, on average. Mm -hmm. But if they stutter too frequently, they stutter and stumble out of flow too frequently. Then they're clearly out of it. They're out of it. So these things... Uh, we've got to minimize in the way that we, we bring them through the instruction process. Yeah, and then teachers claim, although I, I don't know how to deal with this, that kids have got to be roughly getting 90% of the words if they're reading independently, not to become frustrated. Well, that would depend on how many times, as you were saying before just a moment ago, whether what they're reading um, in order for it to say a coherent stream of meaning depends on that level of, of uh, frequency and rightness before it will break down. Well, so, I'm suspicious of it. As, as yeah, as I am too. I am too. Ruler, I mean, by, by the very same virtue that I can, I can read through things by skimming and picking up uh, every three or four key words in a paragraph, scanning fast, you know that I pretty much got the essence of things without having to read all of the words, even in, in a lot of technical material. Yeah, and there's a lot of, of learning where the exhilaration of going from no understanding to understanding is so high that you're really motivated to go on. So it may be the first time you go through, you only recognize 50% of the words. Now you go back and reread it, and you may get higher, you may look something up in a dictionary, you may ask somebody for help, 
and you're motivated enough, mm-hmm. you're you're going to get there. Excellent. But it's a tricky it's a tricky issue, mm-hmm. and and it's not clear what rule really means. Does a rule really mean they verbalize something and now they're going to wind out the verbalization? Does it mean they've sorted out C words in their memory so that all the C words with followed by E, I, and Y are over on you know the left part of the left hemisphere and the words with C followed by anything else are somewhere else? So they facilitate matching or search. That, that part's not clear. You'd think that, that when they get confused, that there's a certain inventory of, of uh, strategies for getting out of the hole of confusion that would bring in the rules. But that the rules aren't something that are necessarily remembered. They're just default patterns of recognizing patterns. We see when we track kids over several years in you know, learning decoding, that they go from making wild responses to letters, to making only those responses that are plausible for the letter, maybe wrong for that context, but somewhere else that letter has that sound. It's no longer something that would never occur. So they're beginning to narrow down the choices. Then pretty soon they're catching on to which one goes where. This is all just incredible evidence for this incredible undertaking of a five, six, seven, eight-year-old mm-hmm. human brain. It's, it's But think, think for a minute, then I've got to... Yeah, okay, yes, thank you. Think problems. for a minute about what has to happen in reading. Let's assume you're, you're reading orally, just to take a, a case. Mm-hmm. And let's say you're in the middle of a line. The word you're focusing on now is not what you're saying. You're articulating two or three words back. Mm -hmm. So at this time now that you're looking at a word and trying to recognize it, you're both in parallel articulating words you've recognized already. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, in peripheral vision, you're beginning to get cues to what's ahead. You're not going to recognize all the letters, but you're going to see there's a white space followed by a small word followed by another small word. And you may then jump to the middle of the two small words for the next fixation. But all of that's going on in parallel. And at the same time, you're moving things up mentally in comprehension, meaning you're closing off kind of propositional units, if you want to think of it that way. You're integrating them into the bigger picture of the text. It's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. It's amazing. And thank thank God they don't depend on us for teaching.